Hello and welcome to The Shift, the podcast that aims to tell the no-holds-barred truth about being a woman post-40. Created and hosted by me, journalist and author Sam Baker. This episode comes to you from the Glasgow kitchen of straight-talking crime writer Denise Mina. She's written 15 novels, including the award-winning The Long Drop and Conviction, which was scooped up by Reese Witherspoon's Hello Sunshine book club. But her latest, The Less Dead, based on a real-life Glasgow serial killer, focuses on what makes a good victim versus a bad one and takes her right back to her political roots. I just think if we're invisible, let's just wear whatever we fucking want. Yeah. So I mean, seriously, if you want to walk about in your pyjamas for the rest of your life, we're invisible. You said we're invisible. Fuck you. If you're a faint heart, you might want to make yourself a strong coffee before you proceed because Denise does not mince her words. Over the next 45 minutes, she talks anger, learning to be assertive, withering vaginas, and creaking joints, and tries, in vain, to teach me the art of confrontation. All while taking a delivery from John Lewis and baking a mean pie. But don't tell her I told you. So, Denise, thank you for having me in your bloody palatial West End home. <laughs> it's mad, isn't it? I can't believe we live here. I was living in a bed set till I was 32. So how did this, how did you go from bed set to... Well, I'd like people to think it's because I'm so successful as a writer, but actually... Well, that's what I thought when I walked past. I kind of walked past. The woman next door in the window probably thought I was like a stalker. I walked past, walked past, walked past. I was thinking, oh my God, she owns this whole fucking house. (laughs) No, it's just a flat. It's not a townhouse. Basically, we bought our old bed set and evicted our former flatmates and did it up and flipped it. And that's why we live here. Well, we're here to talk about loads of things. We're here to talk about your new book, Less Dead, and how the crime writing scene has changed in the time you've been in it. And also the dreaded menopause, because I'm on a mission to make everybody talk about the menopause more. So I loved The Less Dead. Oh, great. Tell me what sparked it, where it came from. Well, tell us a bit about it first and then tell me what sparked it. Well, first, it starts off with uh, Margot waiting at an adoption agency to meet her birth family. And she's there at their request and they don't turn up. And she's waiting and waiting. And as, as you know, if you've ever had a very tense, long wait, your life does tend to flash before your eyes. So when her her aunt eventually does turn up, she's a street sex worker who had a heroin problem in the 80s and she tells her that her birth mother was murdered in Glasgow in the 1980s and was a heroin addict and there were a spate of murders of street sex workers then and the very last one was treated completely differently it was a really lovely girl she had a lovely family and you know the public came forward people were very sympathetic she had a tragic backstory and it really made me think about all the women who died before her and who why, didn't get that treatment. Yeah, why was it so different? Have things changed so much? And and the more I investigated it, the more I thought, it was just that they weren't very sympathetic. Do you have to be sympathetic for mm. people to care? And there was a, in, in crime writing, there's a, there's a new prize called the Staunch Prize, mm. which is for books that do not glamorise violence against young women. I think that's a really good idea. I think it's a good question, but I think it's the wrong answer because I don't think crime fiction is the problem. I think it's how we value victims as a society mm. rather than in terms of crime fiction. So you think crime fiction is reflecting society rather than... Well, I think, you know, we always talk about crime fiction. Is it political? All, mm. all fiction is political, but it appears to be politically neutral if it's very close to the status quo. And the status quo is young, blonde, Aryan children from good families are much more important than, you know, black women who are sex workers. So where does the phrase the less dead come from? Well, it's a term that's used to talk about that valuation of victims according to their social profile. So uh, it's talking about, you know, street sex workers, it's talking about homeless people, and, and it's a term for people whose death or whose murder or whose brutalisation doesn't evoke that kind of huge um, social mm-hmm. indignation. Who uses that? Who? Um, it's, it comes from, I've heard it used most over the past year and a half on true crime podcasts. And right, true yeah. crime podcasts have gone over the course of You're like an three addict, years, really big time, yeah. And it's, you know, as a, as a, a legal academic, it's fascinating because they've gone from being schlock, jock, oh have you heard about this serial killer, to real philosophical examinations of the ethics of what they're doing, of the ethics of the audience's interest. I mean, 
the discourse is absolutely fascinating. Just watching an art form develop like that, it's really amazing to have, to have witnessed that. It's really interesting, isn't it? Because um, my partner always says to me, you know, you are obsessed. You're Are you obsessed as I'm well? Obsessed. What do you yeah. listen to? The gruesome serials and the homecoming and all of that. But I loved Michelle McNamara's I'll yeah. Be Gone in the Dark. Absolutely loved that. I haven't listened to that, but I read that. But it's just, I'm obsessed with them. The Less Dead does feel a bit more political than conviction. It reminded me actually most of your really early stuff. It reminded me of Garnet Hill. In yeah, its I think sensibility. I think it, I think you're absolutely right. I think it is, and I was a wee bit nervous about that because I thought, you know, I've done lots of different things, and people get very attached to certain styles. So some people really loved Conviction because it was much more of a romp and it was much more upbeat. And um, some people really just want me to write the long drop over and over again yeah. for the rest of my life. Other people yeah. want Garnet Hill again over and over for the rest of my life. Um, and it is very overtly political, and it is talking about class. And it is talking about poverty um, as a, a reason for people um, doing sex work. And I think sex work and poverty are so all pervasive now. I heard this brilliant interview with this woman in America um, just after a new Congress had passed this legislation that you couldn't contact anybody before you had met them to hook up. And um, so, you know, people couldn't um, make sure they were safe. And she said, you know, sex work is so all pervasive now, you probably know a sex worker. And if you think you don't, it's because they don't feel safe to come out to you. And I think that's probably really true. I know several people who, after I've known them for 15 years, have said, yeah, that's actually how I make my living. And Amazing. Because they found out I was writing this book. And uh, I think it's, you know... um, we really need to talk about the fact that people are doing it for money. They're not doing it because they want to have super sexy times, like the 70s Mm. happy hooker construction or the massive empowerment. Those are real male gazy constructions of sex work. You kind of grew up, effectively, in the 80s, and we were talking earlier about there's some real similarities now. It feels... I feel like a lot of parallels between now and the 80s. It's so alienating, the atmosphere, and it's very, very divided... And I couldn't believe anybody ever voted for Thatcher. I just couldn't believe people would do that. And yet I knew people who, I, you know, obviously they wouldn't tell me because I was dungreed up to fuck and, you know... <laughs> yeah. uh, Snap. I mean, clearly they weren't going to tell me, but I just couldn't believe anybody would vote for that. I didn't understand it. And All my family got their council houses because of Thatcher. I think I'm the only person who didn't buy my mum's council house. There have to be other reasons. <laughs> you know I mean, now you can't get everyone... Everyone at The Guardian and The Observer, a lot of the people working for those newspapers are on short-term contracts. You can't mm. get working terms because of what Thatcher did. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's that short-sighted. But if you offer people with nothing a little bit of something, you can't blame them for taking it, do you know? Yeah. But it's the cynicism and the nastiness that's back again. And it's the real sense of we will trick you into doing things that are not to your benefit. It's funny, actually, because a very close cousin of mine was rich in the 80s, and he keeps saying, I didn't think it was that bad. And I was very poor in the 80s. And and, and I said, no, it really was that bad. It was bloody grim. It was awful. And now, you know, coming up to this time, I'm all right. I'm quite comfortable. And you think, how can you make sure that you don't blind yourself to how awful this is and how grim it's going to be? I feel like disgusting as Thatcher was she believed in what she was doing yeah. whereas now it feels it just feels like contempt it feels like they're like selling things off it feels yeah. like the sell. it feels like a fire sale it doesn't feel like a mission I, I really wonder if avarice is an illness how much can you need how much can you some of them don't even have kids what are you going to do with the money you're going to be dead in 20 years what's What's have you, wrong with you? Is, have you always had this mentality, or is this a mentality that's developed as you've got older? Well, you obviously have always been left because you joined the Revolution Communist Party to chase a boy. But <laughs> no, I was just horny. <laughs> <laughs> but the kind of one of the things I've noticed talking to older women is it's kind of I guess a losing interest in stuff mm-hmm. and acquisition and finding the kind of pursuit of things increasingly revolting. 
Is that a new and thing for you or is it a constant thing? No, it's a constant thing. And it's because I read Keep the Aspidistra Flying when I was very young. I mean, I did law and I could have gone into legal practice. And at that time, it was a really good living. And I thought, no, I'm not going to chase money. Because I'd seen people chasing money. And, and money is a metaphor for happy or content in mm, the world. Yeah. All my friends live here and none of us have ever moved. So we all lived in a big rundown flat. These are the people I evicted. And, yeah, um, your ex-friends. Yeah, my ex-pals. <laughs> we're, we're thinking about how to grow old well. You know, yeah. and I think one of the things is you need to stay near each other. You need to stay outward focused. So we're all looking to do voluntary work together. You need to remain physically active, but most importantly, you need to remain engaged in the world. Mm. You know, and how do you remain compassionately engaged in the world without just being really angry all the time? Uh, I think voluntary work is a way to do that. You know, local, small, short-term achievements. You know, gardening taking pleasure in the day, having dogs and all that kind of thing. But I think I don't think I was ever really into stuff. And we moved in here, and it's a huge flat. And my immediate yeah, thought was, amazing. how can we maximise the space? Because I think avarice has its own momentum. Mm. And I watched myself wishing for another room. Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> I've just walked around this flat. It is incredible. But, but the thing is, people worked up to getting a house that you could settle in. Yeah. And then you got a house that was so big. I mean, one of the things about lockdown is I know loads of people who realised they were living in houses that they couldn't clean. If your cleaning lady can't come in, you live in a tip. And, you know, your family are used to having a cleaning lady coming in and doing all the work. They don't even know how to hold a brush, some of them. So it's down to you, do you know what I mean? Yes, so that's that's where avarice kind of takes you. And I think avarice takes up a lot of space in your head as well. Did you read Keep the Aspidustra Flying? Long, long time ago. But it's just about how people use having stuff as a metaphor for being content and engaged and actually just be content and engaged. I know people who've made fortunes and they spend all their time managing the money and it's joyless. And they're quite anxious about losing their stuff or their stuff being minimised or, you know, shares dropping in value or it is just another chore, you know? Mm. It is another chore. It's another thing to do and moving on and being responsible. Even really good people who accidentally made a fortune then spending a year going around looking at charities to give the money to. Apparently to be happy, what you need is enough and 15% more than your best friend. <laughs> <laughs> that probably goes for absolutely everything and your best friend, isn't it? Yeah. It's like yeah, 15% thinner. That's who you measure yourself against. It's not that you want to beat your best friend, but you just want to feel a bit lucky. So it's not actually about having anything. It's really just about feeling a bit lucky. Feeling like you're not hard done by. I remember when my first book got published and I, I was saying to people, my income has quadrupled. But what they didn't realise was I was living on five grand a year. You know, and this is yeah. not that long ago. So I mean, I was living on absolutely nothing. And in Glasgow at that time, nobody wanted to live here. So I basically had that front room as my bed set. And it's like a ballroom. You know, it's a big, big front room mm. with high ceilings. And, and that was my bed set. And it was beautiful. And it was in a beautiful bit of the town. And my outgoings were absolutely tiny. So you need enough. But then you just end up looking for things to spend it on. Like people who've got more cars than they could physically fit in. What's the point? Do you know what I mean? Or they go on three holidays a year. What's, it's just busy work, isn't it? Yeah, it's the financial equivalent of that. Basically. Yeah. So you were a lawyer, feminist academic. Yeah. What made you write crime novels? Well, I was doing a PhD in the differential rates of ascription of mental illness to female offenders as compared with male offenders, which is very, very boring. And I thought, no one's ever going to read this because it's so dull. But if you could put this idea in a crime novel, then lots of people would read it to find out who the murderer is. And that's a much better way to disseminate information through narrative. Narrative's famously good for disseminating information. Sam, you know, writing's a compulsion. Mm. It's not really a life you choose. And sometimes people talk about it and they say, oh, this was my business plan. And you're like, you're kidding yourself on. Do you know what I mean? I'm going to sell this many and I'm going to... Do you know, I write for the movies and all this kind of thing. You're right. It, most people are writing because they feel a compulsion to play with words and make things with words. So interesting to me that Garnet Hill was your first and The Less Dead is your 15th? 15th. Is that right? Yeah. What year did you write that? Was that been the 90s? 1996. Because to me, the parallels between those two books are huge. It's really, I think that, it's really God, that's dead interesting. interesting. Yeah. Yeah, but the protagonist is more middle class. I mean, the thing about Margot is she is very middle class and relatable. Mm. And I think one of the things I really noticed about Garnet Hill was 
The vast majority of readers of crime fiction want to identify with someone who is quite posh. I don't think it's because the readers are posh. It makes it more relatable. Or I don't know if it's the reviewers feel comfortable with that character. A lot of the less said is about Margot coming to terms with her own privilege. What were you seeking to do with that? Well, I mean, it's very prescient now, but at the time it wasn't. It was kind of, it was a bit random. I mean, that is exactly what I wanted to talk about, but I don't think it would have those resonances if it hadn't have been for Black Lives Matter, because we're aware of that. We're thinking about that, and we're thinking, you know, could I possibly be part of the problem, you know? Mm. And um, But Margot just thinks she's normal. She doesn't like to think... It's uncomfortable to think about your privilege. It's uncomfortable to question yourself. It's uncomfortable to think, you know, am I being kind or am I being a patronising cow? Mm -hmm. It's uncomfortable to think, you know, maybe I should take advice about this. So she she meets this woman, Nikki, who's her aunt. Her aunt is a clean heroin addict, street sex worker, and Margot thinks she might be able to help her and she has to be pleasant to her. And what she doesn't realise is Nikki is much smarter than she is, but she's never had the chance to go to university or study medicine but she's a very very clever woman and I think quite often if there is an educational gap in a family if you're the first generation to go to university which I am you really notice the difference between your approach to things which seems self-evident and other people's approach people who have not had that chance I mean my mum's generation left school at 14 but she's so she is very privileged and if she was murdered People would care. Nikki says they'd bring the army in if you got murdered. Mm. But because um, her mum was one of the less dead, nobody really cared about her. So right now we've got, you know, social media and we talk all the time about victim blaming, victim shaming, some victims being good victims, other victims being bad victims and therefore not getting any attention. Do you think it's ever going to change? Because we're talking about it a lot now, but it doesn't look to me like anything's very different. I think narrative is a great way to change attitudes. I think, you know, I think The Mask. Do you remember that film with Eric Roberts, was it? Yes. That was the only film I can ever think of where a central, good, sympathetic character had a facial deformity. So if you think about facial deformity as a trope in narrative, in Bond films, if you've got facial deformity, you're a bad guy. Um, Facial deformity universally is a trope for a bad guy. If you think about if a lot of sympathetic characters happened to have a a facial deformity, not that the whole film is about facial deformity, social attitudes to facial deformity would be very different. And I think if we have... Victims. I mean, in Conviction, the central character, you had to get to know her before you found out what had happened to her because it was a way to try and make the audience sympathise with someone before what had happened to them became known. And so I think things are happening, stories are changing. And if you think about, um, what was that Reese Witherspoon? It was brilliant. Big Little Lies. Big Little Lies was absolutely brilliant for that because it really made the victim character a fully rounded character. But you know, when I started writing crime fiction, a rape victim was always somebody who um, either died or got to marry the detective. That was the best that you could possibly hope for was that you would get a better boyfriend. And that's really changed. So I think narrative is a good way to change it. I think even an awareness, you know, people being aware, but it takes a long time for these things to actually filter down to juries. What else do you think has changed since you started writing crime fiction? Well, my first book was, I was interviewed by a guy and he said, quite a few people actually said, are you a feminist? Because they were a bit embarrassed to even ask me the question. Because it was in the 90s, it was yeah, real... it was a dirty word. Yeah, it was 90s. a real dirty word, you know, and because, you know, your central character is a female. And uh, I said, yeah, I did know that. And, um, <laughs> yeah, and, I, and, and I am a feminist, but, the, you know, the feminists that everyone's really scared of, that are really shouty and angry... That's the kind I am. <laughs> <laughs> and then a few years ago, somebody said to me, your central character is a female. Don't you think that's a bit of a cliche? Uh, no, that's brilliant. Yeah. It's really, really changed. And it's our yeah. generation of writers who have changed that. That's true. That's so true. it has really, really changed. Because when I started, it was a really odd thing to do. And there was me, there was Val McDermott, Sarah Paretsky. That was pretty much it. In Holland, male writers use a female pen name for sales. Mainly because Sam. it's women who buy crime. Uh, because Tana French has sold so well. You know, I mean, think about it. These things are changing. That's amazing, isn't yeah. it? How was the boys' club when you joined it? Did they let you in? I don't really want in a club. I've yeah. got my ten pals I'm ever going to have. Yeah, I mean, I was made to feel very, very welcome. But, um, I mean, there weren't a lot of crime writers in Scotland. It wasn't, that, you know, if, you, if you, you lived in London, you would be in the club. 
but in Scotland... Yeah, it was pre-Tartan Noir. It was way pre-Tartan Noir. So, I mean, there really wasn't a scene here at all, you know? Yeah, unlike now. I think there's about 40 crime writers published in Scotland currently. And is that predominantly male or mixture? I think crime writing in general is 50-50. I think in Scotland it's about three quarters male. It's a bit macho. There's like an England versus Scotland football team. I think, yeah, where's the women? Uh, When Bloody Scotland started, all the women in their gift bag got a scarf and the men got a bottle of whiskey. Uh, Uh, Yeah, so Scotland's always 20 years behind in terms of change of politics. Give me the whiskey. <laughs> you know, it's well meant. Do you know what I mean? I mean, when I came here from London, because I grew up in South London and I came to Scotland, it was like the war had just finished in terms of gender politics. Mm. Really, it was kind of hilarious. People would call you a young lady. Now when they say it, I think they're being sarcastic. You have to get to their mid-50s for someone to call you a young lady. Um, as a joke. But the g- gender politics in Scotland are always way behind, I think. And is it 100% white? Crime fiction is so white and we should not be. I mean, I think publishers are really making big strides to get more diverse books out. And there are a couple of really brilliant writers coming up now. Dorothea Kunzman, Oyen Braithwaite, you know, quite a few people, but not nearly enough. We don't reflect our whole community. I mean, there have been a lot more women writing crime since the rise of the kind of psychological thriller genre. Do you think that's helping with the the problem of an awful lot of crime, you know, the main female character being a body in the hall before, you know, it, and it that's really, it? Well, it really is. And, you know, I mean, I, I, when you know that, that, that things are really changing when you read crime fiction and you fundamentally disagree with the, the values in it. I was talking to somebody recently and it was a big, big production company and they were thinking about developing Garnet Hill and they said, oh, wow. well, yeah, and it was a big broadcaster <laughs> actually face. and they dropped it at the last minute they dropped it several times and they said the thing is we've got five things in production that are about women who can't remember properly Oh, fuck just think off. about that no, think about that <sighs> story of women who can't remember properly and I said you know that's really not what Garnet Hill is about the point is she can remember and nobody else can remember and so that's like something that I was thinking about way back then because at that point we had the false memory syndrome defence in courts and that was part of the reason that I wrote Garnet Hill and it's still a trope in stories that women can't quite remember properly and I said what about men who can't remember properly? It's called post-traumatic stress disorder It's not just that but it's about women being women's memories being more questionable than men's Mm. why is that fucking gendered? Why are we not saying... Ted Bundy isn't lying. He can't remember what he's done because he's not well. Do you know, why, why is it always about women making allegations who don't remember properly? Why is it never about men committing these acts who are not remembering? Why are women pervious and men are solid? Why are we constructing femininity as intensely problematic and saying that, that men are normal? Do, do you know what I mean? Mm, yeah, Why is exactly. it always about women don't quite know what's going on? Some of us are a bit depressed and we know exactly what's fucking going yeah. on. <laughs> we keep we've been telling you what's going on for 25 years, but you're not listening. You know? I think mainstream thriller fiction often reflects the concerns of the day, sometimes in very bad ways. You know, And I'm certain that we will see a story over the next few years about a person of colour using their colour as a defence... I'm certain we will. But these narratives are so retrogressive, they're really problematic. And in the future, they'll be looked back on and with dismay, you know, that you could have that, you know. Marnie, which is a Hitchcock film. Yes. Uh, Have you seen Marnie? Yeah, not for ages. but Well, Sean Connery, basically, a woman is very traumatised from having been sexually abused as a child and Sean Connery rapes her better. So this is why you don't see it very often, that film. Uh, and that was, a, that was a narrative construction at that time that we now know is absolute... It's really damaging nonsense, you know? Um, he forces her to have het- heteronormative sex and it makes her better. She becomes a wee wifey. Oh, and all is well with the world. And everything's... So that's all she ever needed was Sean Connery to punch her in the face and rape her. On the plus side, that film couldn't be made now. No, you couldn't, because you it's couldn't. so reflective of the fears of the time, you know? I'm just going to say it. Gone Girl is really, really, really problematic. A-, a wife goes missing, the husband looks guilty, but it's really because she's hiding, because she's such a bitch. Two women are murdered by their partner every week. 
that is so problematic, that narrative. What are you talking about? I mean, it is interesting and it is very captivatingly told, but there's no reason why you couldn't have another story in that narrative shape. I think these, these narratives will be looked at in a different way. But then maybe the fact that you can disagree with things fundamentally means that there's a good broad span of work being published. I don't know. What do you think it means that that trope is such a massive smash hit globally? I have no idea. Can't say anything good. Nobody knows why books sell really well. I think it's a good, really, really well-written book. To be honest, I think it's very well-constructed but I think it could have been a different story. It's about the structure of it, not about the content, and that's very true of a lot of books that sell really well. Let's let's talk about menopause. Let's do it. Let's do it. We're actually having this conversation a couple of days after Michelle Obama did a whole podcast about it. And now everybody's going, oh, that's right, we can talk about menopause now because Michelle Obama has. Um, And I'm delighted that Michelle Obama has talked about being hot and sweaty and getting brain fog and having to open the window and all that. But where are you in your Um, shift? Well, I think it started about three years ago and, uh, and I'm on patches, but I'm still quite sweaty at night. And I've developed a physical uh, condition which every joint clicks. Oh God! Yeah, and oh, if if it that's was a new symptom on me. Well, if they were inflamed, it would be osteoporosis, but or arthritis, I think. But because it's just noisy, I mean, it is like a bag of dominoes being dropped on the floor whenever I get up or move or anything. Uh, and it's rather delightfully called crepitude. <laughs> oh my God! <laughs> that's <laughs> Sorry, that's worse than atrophy. <laughs> crepitude. Oh my god. When did you get crepitude? Um, I think about a year ago. But my girlfriends and I are all very uh, open about it. And there's a couple of friends who have been talking about the perimenopause since we were about 18. We've got a thing where we're trying to make sure we don't all put on too much weight, uh, but we WhatsApp each other our weight like, you know, once a week. Really? And we're charting ourselves ballooning gently. But we've got a friend who lost loads and loads of weight and she looks like a, an empty ball sack. She looks terrible. So we don't want to lose too much weight. You don't want to lose loads of weight, but you don't want to absentmindedly balloon while you're doing other things. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. You just want to be aware. And uh, we used to all go to aerobics together. We went to aerobics, we went to step, we went to boxer size. We've been through every exercise we fad. We've been quite shit at all of them. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? We just want to make sure our hearts stay healthy. And then every so often we meet up and have a big blowout. I'm talking about this as if we're training for the Olympics. But honestly, <laughs> we're all between... It feels like it. Though. We're all between 10 and a half stone and 15 stone. So please don't think for a minute that we're... <laughs> <laughs> no, I feel like I really want to be good at exercise. Well, no, not that I want to be good at it. I want to like it. You don't like, like it. it? No, not particularly. Because I kind of got that puffy middle thing several people said try weights so I did weights and I did love the fact that it started to pull everything back in again but I didn't really love it I think you don't really always enjoy it but you do feel good after that's what you're looking for it's good for your mood and it's good for regulating your you know your temper and you can get better at it as well you know yeah Mm. but you've never found anything that does it for you no I walk a lot yeah I walk a lot but that's um that's about it. Is it? Yeah. That's well, very good for you, and it's very on um, damaging to your joints. So you might true. not get crepitude. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, those are your options. Crepitude or osteoporosis? <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Um, I want to talk a little bit about HRT. So you have patches. Were you aware or caught up at all in the politics around HRT? My mum was on HRT for a really long time possibly an illegal length of time yeah. and I was very aware of HRT but to be honest with you I'm, I was very aware of the politics and the, you know the non-normalisation of menopause but I am sexually active and my fanny started drying up and sex became painful and I just thought fuck it yeah that's that's the honest truth like you know I mean yeah. I, I need my vagina I need that thing so that was why I went on HRT yeah. and it's worked for me no I had that. Well, you read, can read the chapter on atrophy. Atrophy. I'm not sure whether it's a Vaginal or Vaginal atrophy. Yeah, it's yeah. like, God, that's... And it literally means withering, doesn't it? Yeah. It's fucking awful. Withering vagina and crepitude of the joints. 
<laughs> but it's great being on this side of the menopause. <laughs> Tell me about your hair, Denise. My hair? Your hair. Uh, for anybody who doesn't know what Denise looks like, we'll bloody Google a picture and have a look. <laughs> You've just got the most amazing grey spiky hair. I love it. When, why, how, what was the decision? Well, I started going grey at 19. Ah. And for about 15 years I was saying, I think I'm going to go grey. I kept saying to hairdressers, I'm going to go grey. And, and then I went once when Mac first opened in Glasgow, I went and I got, I said, look, my skin's getting older. Can you show me how to do makeup for older people? Because I was still wearing red lipstick and stuff like that. And they basically just made me look like a clown. They haven't a clue. They don't know. Nobody knows about older makeup. Nobody knows Mm. how to enhance what you've got. Do you know what I mean? They're just like drawing, like putting concealer under your bags under your eyes. I quite like the bags under my eyes. I like concealer in it. It just fills up the pockets, doesn't it? It It just looks disgusting. It looks cadaverous. Doesn't it? Yeah, and it's and, uh, and I was dyeing my hair, and I was wearing the wrong makeup, and um, I wear so much less makeup than I used to wear. And then one day, I just suddenly thought, there, nobody knows how you're supposed to look when you're older, and you're supposed to be invisible. Mm. So I'm just going to fuck it. I'm just going to wear whatever I want. I'm going to do my own hair. I'm going to stop dyeing it. And I went to a really good hairdresser. And I said, look, I'm going grey, and I want to go grey. And she said, well, let's cut it short. So she cut it short and, and I just went grey and I started doing, you know, makeup that suits somebody. When you get to a certain age, if you, unless you're blessed with lovely lips, your lips do get thinner. Mm. So lipstick might not be your friend, but you need a bit of colour on your face because you're grey. So I went for red eyeshadow and because uh, I thought, well, you know, just what you're supposed to do with makeup is you're supposed to enhance what you've got. And I have got quite red eyes. <laughs> <laughs> Just for the record, it's not bright red. It's kind of like a russety. It's blusher, of, is it? Blusher. You can't get red eyeshadow. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, and the eyebrows. Your eyebrows tend to thin out a bit. Yeah, yeah. You discover so, eyebrows when you hit fifty, don't you? Yeah, big time. Yeah. But eyebrows are a great marker for the face, you know. So um, eyebrows and eyeliner and red eyeshadow and no red lipstick and also blusher. I never used to wear blusher because I always mm. had a big red face. I had a sort of, no, I did. I had a big farmer's daughter red face, like diagonal stripes from the inside of my eye to the jawbone. Really? Yeah, I looked really, I looked like a kind of breed, breeding heifer. Honestly, I looked so <laughs> I find healthy. that really hard to believe. <laughs> I used to wear, I used to wear this, this stuff you got from Boots and it was green stuff to cut out the red. Uh, yeah, so, yeah. And also I was very freckly like you and I was very shy about being freckly. Whatever you are, you hate. Yeah. And, um... So I used to wear a lot of uh, foundation and stuff. To cover up the freckles. Yeah. Oh, and uh, and then um, I just thought... Because, you know, I mean, nobody knows what you're supposed to look like when you're older. And they, no. this dress is German. And it's a German make that make a... Tu- it's a dress shape called tulip. So the waist stops slightly before your waist. And then it goes out. And then it comes in. So it gives you a womanly shape rather than a, you know, cut crop top. And mm. yoga pants, which are comfortable, they're not your friend. No, you know? no, they're not your friend. It's not. like chunky men wearing pleated trousers. No, <laughs> you're a handsome man. Don't wear that. Have mm. you felt invisible? Actually, I thought I was invisible because I was just dot- dotting about wearing mad stuff. But in Glasgow, you can, you know. Yeah. You can honestly for years. In Glasgow, I've kind of been walking about in fancy dress. Lots of people in Glasgow do that. Yeah. And people congratulate you. There's <laughs> yeah. no hostility. You know, I was, yeah. I was, there was a shelf stacker the other day in Tesco's. It was at seven in the morning. It's like COVID anxiety. I'm up out shopping. And the guy says, see that what you're wearing? Well done. Really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Love it. And uh, so, you know, people comment on what you're wearing all the time. But I don't, you know... I haven't really felt invisible, but I think, you know, if you're very shy, having a strong look is a good thing. Are you very shy? I'm in my head a lot. I'm not shy, actually. I don't really get social panic. Mm. And also, I don't know if you find this as I get older, I don't care what you think, but people tell me what they think of me all the time. Yeah. I don't really give a fuck. Yeah. (laughs) Do you know what I mean? And people do say, you look like this, you look like that, you know, you did this, you did that, I think this about you... My engagement with you is... I mean, you want to be gracious about it because you don't want to be rude to people or make people feel small. But at the same time, 
I talk to you. I don't know about you, but I'm at a point where possibly for the first time in my life, I am learning to not really care what people think about me. As a writer, you come out of the house maybe every two years into a sort of public blare and you come out sometimes and realise, oh God, I'm really out of fashion. People hate me. <laughs> and then two years later, you come out and people love you. And it's, but I don't know, maybe they've heard a story about you or it's just your time or you chime yeah, with other things that are thing. going on. Yeah. So it changes all the time. So you don't know what other people are thinking about you. Yeah, because Conviction was a Reese Witherspoon, Hello Sunshine book club pick, wasn't it? Yeah. Last year. How was, was that weird? Because that's quite a level of attention, isn't it? It was very weird. It was really, really weird. And um, uh, I was sitting in a dirty bed that needed changed in a filthy bedroom, taking calls from like six different studios in the States that wanted to develop it as a film. And um, yeah, it was, it was very weird. Yeah. You don't want to take that stuff too seriously because as a writer, you just want to keep writing. That's really yeah. My life's at the desk and the other stuff's... It's good fun... And it's nice, and uh, you know I don't want it to not happen, but you don't want to take it too seriously because it comes and goes, doesn't it? You know. Oh, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, it totally does. Yeah. What's your emotional age? I think I've always been fifty-six. Really? Yeah, I do. I was so bad at being young. I was real. I was very aware of being very bad at being young. I've got a friend who's thirty, and she also is about fifty-six. That is fascinating. Yeah. I've always been into the movement of the day. I've always been into drinking tea. I went on an Ibiza uncovered holiday once with two pals and they were going to nightclubs and picking up guys and all that kind of thing. And I was there to see the churches. I genuinely <laughs> thought... <laughs> I'm interested in documentaries. Do you remember Time Watch? Yes. yes. I loved Time Watch. So I think, I, I think I've always been about 56. So, you know, I think this is my time. <laughs> but you know we, we, we fetishise youth so much but it's not yeah. for everybody what emotional age are you? oh god I don't know I do like being early 50s for the first time in my life I feel really like at ease in myself I don't think I ever have even really? as a small child really? so I'm not what sure what was the unease? I was always in the therapy speak I was always hyper vigilant Mm -hmm. In my late teens, I was in an abusive relationship that I've only recently really kind of yeah. done the work on. Yeah. I don't know what, whether you've ha ever had this, but my nan was one of those women who could ice a room. Mm -hmm. There was no temper losing, but you always knew when you were in trouble. And so even as a small child, I became very, very good at learning not to... Upset the boat, things. not to upset things. So you're a peacemaker. always silent, yeah. That's good for an editor. Well, yes and no. It makes for a terrible boss. Does it? Yeah, because you're not confrontational. So instead of just going, okay, I'm going to deal with this and move on, like, you know, which is a great way to be, I think, you end up being, well, oh, I don't want to upset that person, I don't want to upset that person. I just, if I just, if I hadn't done that, what would have happened if I'd, ha you know, and I'm less, I'm still a bit like that, but I'm less, much less like that. So I like being the age I am. I'd probably like to have my 35-year-old body back, mm. if I'm honest. My 35-year-old body was fat as fuck. <laughs> really <laughs> unfit, yeah. No, I'm so happy to to be the age I am. It's a great thing to be fat in your 30s, and then when you get to your 50s, get a bit fit, and you're like, wow, my knees still work. Mm. Are you confrontational now? No. Would you like to become confrontational? Let's become more confrontational. Why have you got less tips? Um, I don't, but I'm very confrontational. And I grew up in a plate-smashing family. And I feel like I could teach you to be yes. comfortable with confrontation, to be comfortable with your own shouty voice, maybe. I would love that. Let's do that. Look over my shoulder and say, I'm fucking furious with you. Don't look at me, because that's very difficult for you. But I'm not fucking furious. It doesn't matter. <laughs> you will be in a minute. You shout it loud enough. <laughs> I literally, I can't do it. I think a lot of women are afraid to be confrontational because they're afraid of taking up space. Yeah. You know, you know yeah. how women always sit with their legs crossed? Yes. If you ever go on a bus, sit with your legs wide and your elbows out and take up space. That's a really good practice. You instantly sit up straighter when you do it as well. Instantly. It's very uncomfortable. Women's language is very different than men's language because they put in conditionals. Being assertive is not about being aggressive or rude. 
It's just about being clear. How have your rage levels been as you've got older? Much, much better. Oh, better. Oh, God, I was so angry when I was young. So, so angry. That was a time of Andrea Dworkin and, you know, the feminist movement was really... Rage was uh, very much the kind of chosen style. So I've learned lots of techniques for dealing with anger. And then when I had kids... And I realised I didn't want them to grow up with a really angry mum because that's a big, mm. it's a bad, bad thing for kids. So I started really working on anger. You think it's keeping you safe and then when you have kids you realise this isn't keeping them safe, it's just making them really scary, making them really scared, you know? Yeah. And yeah. so they think the world's full of threat and their, their primary caregiver is um, a nutter. <laughs> go off at any moment. <laughs> but for, so you started going through the menopause at 46. Yeah. When did you realise that's what was happening? Did you fanny dry up? Not straight. How did no, you notice? The, uh, no, my fanny dried up later. Right. A bit later. So, um, no, I thought I was just going completely mad. I oh had really God, bad Sam. anxiety. I mean, it's really interesting. Quite a lot of people talk... I mean, I didn't go so far as thinking I had dementia... Which some people have actually said to me, they've gone to the doctor and said, I think I'm getting early onset dementia. And they've ah. gone, oh, are you menopausal? It's like, Fuck why you. doesn't anybody tell, yeah. tell you these things? No, I had really bad anxiety, confidence through the floor, rage, rages, you know, brain fog, the whole bit. I didn't have a clue what was going on. I've always had loads of gynecological problems, so my periods weren't a great right. steer. And then I, th- I read something, an article, and I thought, and so then I started asking all my friends, like people who were a little bit older than me, and they all were, kind of went, no, what are you talking about? So actually I was really lucky because I had a private gynaecologist. Right. So instead of going to my GP and starting that rigmarole that of being lucky. given antidepressants yeah. and all of that, I went back to her and she, you know, kind of checked her thing out and just kind of went, yeah, and we, we worked, I worked through it with her. Right. So I reckon it took me 18 months to realise that I wasn't just a completely hopeless one loser. Of my, one of my best friends is 40. She's got styes. Her skin is changing. She's not sleeping. Her moods yeah. are up and down. And um, That is it, definitely. I, it is. And yeah. I, t- I had to say to her, I think you are going through the menopause and I think you need to go to the doctor and get some patches yeah, and um, she did, and they didn't suit her. She gets, so she's going to have to find something else. Yeah, there are but lots big, of different things. It's a big thing to say to someone else. I think you've yeah. got the menopause. Well, that's because Why? it feels like a reproach. It's because it's such a negative. For me, that's what the the whole thing about the book and where this whole idea came from is that I really believe it's the start of something. It's yeah. the start of the next whole period of freedom, if yeah. you like, in your life. But the way society sees it, it's like, oh, you're no longer childbearing, if you Mm. ever were. So you're useless. Mm -hmm. You're kind of, you know, we're not bothered with you anymore. Mm. So to say to someone, I think you're menopausal, it is in the terms of our society is to say... You're done. Yeah, you're done. It's all dry fannies and tenor pads and... Yeah. You know, when it's it's not at all. And even I know a lot of women who do talk about it, but they only talk about negative individual symptoms. They don't talk about that phase of your life. Some people just sail through. Other people get all of the symptoms it's possible to get, you know. It's just then other people just... Yeah. Don't. But I think you only know about hot flushes, so... Really? And even those are not the same thing. You know, there's like the night sweats, you know, which are completely different to daytime hot flushes, which are... Can just roar in from nowhere. Yeah. And it's like dripping. Yeah. And it's just disgusting. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's interesting. I think, anyway. So I'm I think it's fascinating. On about it. No, but I think it's fascinating because it's about taking women out of the male gaze and making us, making a space for us out with, you know, the perception of you as a commodity, as a sexual mm-hmm. commodity. Isn't it? That's, yeah. That is what you're doing. I mean, I think that's fascinating. I think that's brilliant. And I just really think that, I mean, I use this quote a lot and I, I, and I always get the name of the programme wrong, but there's a, the one with Jane Fonda and Lily Tomlin, Grace and Frankie. Frank, Grace yeah, and Frankie. Yeah. And there's a brilliant, when Jane Fonda says, they're trying to buy a packet of fags and they can't get served. And she's like, if you can't see us, you can't stop us. And I, I oh, really that's like great. that. That's and I great. Really feel, I really feel like that. Yeah. Um, Anyway, I just think if we're invisible, let's just wear whatever we fucking want. Yeah. So, I mean, seriously, if you want to walk about in your pyjamas for the rest of your life, we're invisible. You said we're invisible. Fuck you. Do you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So 
So I've got a few questions that I always ask at the Go end. Go um, Firstly, just for the hell of it, because everybody loves a book recommendation, just recommend a, a book that you've read lately that you rated. What have I read that I loved? A History of Salt. Really? Yeah, see, yeah, yeah. It's just about, I watched a book. You are 56, aren't yeah, you? Really, <laughs> yeah, really. It's, it's quite boring. <laughs> uh, I watched a brilliant documentary series um, about the Silk Road, and it's kind of like that. It's a, like a travelogue through history mm. and, and space and geography. It's great. Oh, I love food and travel programmes. If they can combine it, that's better. That's, it's, it's everything. It's fantastic. What one piece of advice would you want to give young women? Don't worry. Don't spend a lot of time worrying because you're always worried about the wrong thing. So true. You know, it's, that sounds quite catastrophic, but you're always worried about the wrong thing. You're worried that people think you're fat, dumb, you know, not pliable. They're not worried about that. They're worried that you're going to take their jobs and they're worried that you're smarter than them. Also, I think, you know, when things get bad, try and have 10 minutes a day where you do something nice, like have a bath or watch telly. Give yourself 10 minutes off in every day. You know, I think that's brilliant advice. Sophie Hannah told me that. That's fantastic advice. What would your superpower be? Empathy. I would make people not massively empathetic, because I think that's crippling, but I would make people be empathetic, a bit more empathetic, because I think fear is kryptonite to empathy, and that's what stops us looking after each other globally. And who are the older women that you admire? I come from a very big family of women. It's very matriarchal. My great aunt Kate, um, I admired very much. There's a there's a brilliant Shauna McMullen um, artwork in the Scottish Parliament, and she got she got ninety nine women to talk about a Scottish woman that they really admired. And I think most people chose like Mary Queen of Scots or something like that. I chose my great aunt Kate because she was a an immigrant. She was self-educated, she was working class. She came over from Belfast when she was about seven and she you had to write a line, a sentence that summed them up. And it, said, um, it says, uh, confronted with the dusty skirting, she said, my mind's on higher things, and it was. Oh. She was always reciting poetry. Their father, Pa, couldn't read, so he memorised poetry all the time. So they were a great poetry reciting family. And Kate was always reciting poetry while flies settled on food behind her. <laughs> <laughs> so she's somebody I really admired. She always wore a matching hat and handbag. And lastly, how many fucks do you give? Well, this week I'm promoting a book, so I'm giving half a fuck. But as a very general rule, I give minus fucks. And as you get older, you know... It's so hard to care. In fact, you know, sometimes I meet people and they're like, oh, I saw you in the paper. And I'm like, oh, God, that's right. I'm, I'm a celebrity person. <laughs> I just don't really care, do you know. And um, I went to Buenos Aires last year on my own to research project. As a middle-aged woman, it's like a cloak of invisibility. It's wonderful. You can go anywhere. No one is looking um, at you. No one's hassling you. People aren't talking. You can go to a bar, have your dinner, read a book. Nobody's hassling you. It's great getting older, really, you know? That's brilliant. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening. I'd love to hear your feedback. You can reach me on Twitter at Sam Baker and Instagram at the other Sam Baker using the hashtag The Shift. You can hear a new episode of The Shift each week on Acast, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. If you like what you hear, please do rate and subscribe because it really does help other people find us.